see that uh, this is a total fruit volume and this is a CCP fruit volume. So uh, that conversion policy, the fruits can, can contribute 30% of the fruit supply. And also uh, a grass food increase. So, uh, also decline of natural disasters of the crop. And uh, this is in a county level, we're also monitoring the effective irrigation area and also the pure fertilizer volume. From uh, this chart, you can see that there is a constant increase of effective irrigation area in our 100 county uh, monitoring. And also fertilizer uh, goes up rapidly and uh, decline in recent year. And uh, <coughs> the green year per unit, um, you can see in the county level, this in the per, uh, uh, unit of green production increased this much, and our monitoring household increased this much. So in some sense, uh, CCP really increased the productivity of cropland use this, this steady state data. And also we captured the total domain, uh, damage area caused by the natural disasters. Uh, decrease uh, totally, but the drop increase. And uh, I also done some uh, uh, metric analysis from that, you can see the, uh, the green output in the uh, 1,000 to uh, in our 100 counties increased by the, the, the elements uh, for area green and the, the subsidy of green and irrigation and fertilizer. But for CCLP, it's not too significant. I'm sure that uh, the, the implementation of CCLP should uh, lead to increase of uh, the green production. So, this discussion. This is a production probability curve. Uh, when farmers convert their cropland, we get F1 output of uh, ecological fun function. When farmers better and un manage their uh, uh, forest land, they get second output of environmental things at two. And when the uh, CZP automatically, <coughs> uh, eventually uh, achieve its environmental goals, then the, the F3 will be the, three, the third output of environmental production. So if the F3, uh, F3 realized that the production probability curves were out. So that means both agriculture and forestry will increase. So I, this is one of our monitoring households plots. This is the, do, doing some management. This is with, with, without. So uh, from this you can see that there is a different environmental output from these two. And this is one of our monitoring village. It's, it's near uh, uh, water, it's, it goes to a big city in Kunming, and this is a conversion uh, cropland here. If we do not convert this cropland to forest, then the water will be damaged. So uh, actually, uh, CCFP is, is really a, a massive uh, uh, Chinese efforts to reverse our thousand years of deforestation and over exploration of uh, forest land and uh, try to balance uh, agriculture and forestry. Um, and also in uh, our policy design, uh, livelihood has all been, always been the concern of the, this policy and uh, green production has become part of CCFP policy in the second phase. Um, 
and uh, CCFP includes uh, increased uh, rural poor's food security by providing stable subsidies. We provide subsidies for farmers uh, they involved in the project each year, and uh, which guarantee their basic need. This is the decrease of the poverty rate of our modern households. And uh, this is a student survey. From that, you can see the, the poor, the poor get the benefit a lot. <laughs> and uh, this uh, ratio of economic trees and uh, ecological trees. And the uh, CCLP really uh, demonstrates that uh, a developing country could balance its agriculture and the forestry land use when it fully recognized uh, the importance of environmental concerns and uh, when the country's economic uh, developed, uh, it can uh, reinvest uh, to compensate its part the loss of uh, environment. So this is the landscape. We are just a uh, few trip in Yunnan. This is the uh, landscape is really uh, overexplored uh, uh, during the last 2,000 years because, because of the copper uh, uh, mining. And uh, this is the, because of the CCFP, the trees start going there. But uh, uh, when I uh, interview uh, farmers, uh, he uh, very happy about CCFP, but he really worried because after 10 years, CCFP implementation, the subsidies goes down and the agriculture subsidy subsidies goes up and also the price of uh, uh, crop uh, goes up. So he told me that the current uh, uh, CCFP subsidies is only uh, one twentieth of, of his uh, crop land uh, income. So it's, uh, it's really a challenge for the future CCFP policy. And also the <coughs> relationship between forest environmental and green production at smallholders and uh, plot levels uh, should have a considerable potentials to explore for the primary results of IBDRC and, and the CIFO. Really, we, we think after our one year's cooperation with CIFO, we do think we, we do some uh, profound research on the uh, uh, plot and household level. We can find out the relationship between environmental outcomes and, uh, and uh, livelihoods and also food security. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chikwali, who was an independent researcher on environmental forest and biodiversity governance based in New Delhi, India. Uh, this is a presentation she prepared with Ms. Manju Menon, the Program Director of Environmental Justice, the Environmental Justice Program for Namati, also based in New Delhi. Their presentation is entitled, Property, Sustainable Food Production and Forest Management in Smoking Lands. All those who actually put together this panel, uh, it also helped us put together our thoughts about this very interesting subject in many areas, sloping lands in India, uh, which are which are in transition. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this is not what I'm going to speak about is a joint work of Manju and me, uh, and uh, over over the last several uh, years of traveling together in India and uh, working on a variety of issues in these in these parts. over the technological errors and then I'll start. So what, what basically a few things that we're going to be talking about here uh, is how in, in India in sloping lands how there has been over the years and ever since uh, pre-colonial times in India there has been a separation of farms and forests in policy. While these landscapes kind of they, they all merge together, they are together in policy and in, in interventions of the government uh, as well as aid agencies, there has been the separation between farms and forests. Uh, 
this happened, this, although this, this whole project of separation started in pre-colonial times, it was also after India's independence uh, in 1947 that this separation actually continued. And uh, yeah, and it kind of gave an impression that both forests and farms provide different things when they're actually part of an integrated landscape in, in, in the two, especially in the two places that I'll be talking about uh, later on in this presentation. Uh, and in both these places, uh, which, which I'll be speaking about, they exemplify how forest regulation in India, uh, ever since you know, ever since the 1980, 1800s, but especially after from 1927 onwards, have had different experiences in different landscapes. People have responded differently. Governments have intervened differently for forest regulation, and it's, it's had a been very interesting role to play, even when it comes to land use change. Uh, yeah, so just, just as I mentioned before, forests were separated from food, uh, food producing areas with forests, very interesting, uh, we, as we all know, also provide food. So often in, when we talk about food security, it's about either you know, increasing uh, agricultural production, uh, putting more, more uh, areas under cultivation. In the previous presentation, there was an entire, entire uh, justification to actually talk about forests themselves providing food. Um, and farms also provide cash. So th these are the these are the these are the kinds of issues that we are we were, we've been trying to deal with in the whole thing. Yeah, but I think what what also is significant to understand is that what really gets affected by these hard boundaries is not just mobilities of people, but also the freedom to choose what is food and how it should be produced. So actually, by forcing plantations and farmlands in our agroforest forestry schemes. Or, in show, and, and, or saying that cultivation should take place in, in forests, there, there is a certain kind of forced intervention that is taking place through policies and aid, aid programs, or for that matter, even newer schemes under the climate change regime through payment for to ecosystem services. There is an induced way of how food should be produced, of what should be conserved, and how, how, uh, what, what is good uh, for, for the globe, what is global good. Yeah, over the years, there has also been uh, uh, you know, forests have been seen as revenue, revenue generating units. So, uh, you know, they've been they've been gradually freed up for business. Uh, timber has been a very very significant part of the colonial expansion in India, and has also the proposed you know, colonial times. And the value of timber continues to, and or the focus on timber continues to be very strongly there in forestry programs, including in India's new uh, Green India Mission and other programs, which are which are talking about uh, intervention under, uh, under climate change. Uh, I'll be speaking about two specific areas uh, in different parts of India, uh, which, which signify upland uh, agroforest mosaics. Uh, and uh, one is part of southern, southern western, uh, western part of India in the state of Karnataka. It is called Uttar Kannada. Uh, it's part of the western hearts of India, and everybody here would know about western hearts. Uh, it's dominated by farming by the Brahmin community. In, in the Indian caste system, Brahmins are not known to be a farming community. But this is, this is probably the only farming Brahmins uh, who, who, who actually cultivate spice gardens and uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, agroforestry practices. And they are they're the most studied areas. But, but very interestingly, if you look at policy uh, documents, they have been, many of these areas have been missed when it comes to uh, forestry intervention programs because, and especially when it comes to uplands, because they don't really fit into the definition of uplands. You know, the, 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 some of the planning documents, planning commission documents speak about 600 meters of the minimum, minimum elevation for, for an area to be considered as upland. But they behave pretty much like upland and lowlands uh, in these areas. But because of the 600 meter elevation, Uttar Kannada has not seen any of those uh, uh, development, government development interventions, uh, which is might be good or bad. Uh, and the other area I'm talking about is the North uh, northeastern part of India, which is in the state of Sikkim. It is the district of North Sikkim, uh, which is a border area uh, with, with neighboring countries, with Nepal uh, and China. And uh, it, it also, it's, it's in the eastern Himalayas, we're talking about ethnic, ethnic minority communities. And this is relatively understudied. Reaching North Sikkim is not very easy. So it's, if you don't get there, uh, there are landslides, etc. It's not really a studied area. Next please. So in Uttar Karanda, what we are talking about is a is, is a farm forest continuum uh, that, that, that continues to exist even till date. Uh, 
uh, you have you have in one particular area there is there is a reserve forest area there are sacred groves there is paddy and millet cultivation there is spice gardens and there is spectral lands which are these areas which are which have been historically provided to farmers the farming brahmins so that they can collect leaf litter for their spice spice gardens uh, there is multi layered cropping horticultural system arecana pepper vanilla cocoa and a whole range of things that are produced uh, in, in this landscape uh from 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 uh, from earlier times uh, british officers were persuaded to allow farmers to use these areas so there's been historical practice of these common areas where where farmers could actually uh, collect leaf litter so this was this would be under the jurisdiction of the forest department but farmers would be able this is actually the mobility between these the farm and the forest was very very fluid it was constantly it's taking place and continues to do so now uh forests are close by and it's ियोसिएशन Uh, the district continues to have a 70% forest cover because of that, and, and, this, and this fluidity is part of that. Uh, increasingly, because of agricultural policies and because agriculture has been is increasingly becoming unviable in many of these parts, economically unviable. There is there is there is migration. There is also lots of young people not not anymore living in these areas, and the, you know from these landscape people are moving to the cities. there are there is also the, the threat of individualized rights based discourses coming in so let not be the same better land be used by different sets of people i want my individual ownership and right over it so that i can uh, continue using it no matter what the intervention is so that asset building is becoming a part of this whole uh, system there it's beginning to come in it's not not yet established and there is there is what is seen is there is land use change there is land use change because of sale of land even though uh, and and there are looming threats of new hydropower projects coming up because of western ghats uh, you know origins of rivers uh, and a lot of potential of developing uh, hydropower and of course there is resistance there is a resistance to converting the land use uh, uh, into, into into the destructive land uses that are being that hydropower would do large areas of submergence coming up parts of these district has been converted but several parts to be conserved in the area uh, the other uh, the other area that i want to speak about and as mentioned is not not sikkim it's one of the northern most districts of the state of sikkim uh, you are talking about in the lower parts of sikkim there is there is uh, there is rice uh, rice terraces that you would see and in the upper reaches even in especially in areas like zongu the ethnic reserves you would see a large garden of plant large, large scale garden of plantations which have been which have been there for a century or more and this is uh, this is mostly owned uh, and, and commonly owned or individually owned by the by the nature tribal communities and a lot of migrant labor comes in uh, to work on these farms uh, there are this this landscape is also lots of home gardens um, which is integrated part of and i think the significance of the home gardens is also coming up much more now because of what is happening to the carbon cultivation in the area uh, and sikkim actually is is a much newer state in the, in india so it was it was an independent kingdom which became part of the indian state much after india's independence so uh, you know when you view the, the farm forest continue in those parts it needs to be viewed keeping that the history of that uh, how how sikkim really became part of india in mind Yeah. However, despite its 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 difference, forest management has followed the usual method of separation between farm and forest, and it's it's quite significant in Sikkim because what you see in Sikkim is what Manju always talks about is forest checkpoints. There is a distinguished distinction between uh, farms and forests that has come come through forest regulations and forest policies. That you know this is the part that you will cultivate, and this is the part which is under the forest part. That is that is really coming in, coming uh, that has come up in Sikkim uh, in this, uh, ever since it became part of India. Uh, and prior to these these regulations, most of these parts uh, 
uh, we're also for uh, shifting cultivation, slash and burn cultivation, which is uh, in many forest management regimes uh, not considered to be the most ecologically viable. So there has been a replacement of that system that we're talking about. Um, and there have been, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it, was, it was a cyclical opening of plots for multi crop farming, and the remaining plots were left for regeneration, which is part of the shifting cultivation uh, practice. What is, what is happening in North Sikkim now is this large scale, the large cardinal plant issues which was introduced in North Sikkim, um, you know, would, would, would have, been, have been degenerating, there have been pests, there have been other, other problems that have taken place in, in this large cardinal plantations. And uh, due to, you know, the, the attributed reasons which are not completely documented are, are either due to over harvest or, or, or through pests. And these, you know, in many ways, these are things that the policies never really accounted for. That when you when you when you are increasing cardamom per plantation, they are encouraging it, or you know, putting bringing more area under cardamom plantation, which was, which was a very viable crop for the area. You never really anticipating that there would be a sudden drastic decline in this in this, and you know, the entire area would be suddenly people will wonder what to do, and that's why the significance of home gardens is coming up because people are really going back to developing home gardens and and that model in not just the upper region of North Sikkim, but even uh, little lower. Um, yeah, so through these case studies, what, what, do we, what do we think are would be a few emerging issues that probably would be of interest uh, for future research or policy intervention and other discussions in these parts. Um, and they've been, they, they are obviously, the places like North Sikkim are very different from other like, plain areas of the country where large scale, large farms have been introduced, uh, have been part of the landscape. These have been largely smallholder farms, uh, working fairly sustainably uh, over the years. Yeah, so in many ways, uh, they are trapped in their geography. Yeah, and other than that, there have been uh, other than the land use conversion for either agroforestry or either for, either for conservation plantation purposes or increasing productivity, there are, these areas are also under threat of different kinds of land use. Sikkim is, is has, people in Sikkim have been actually resisting a lot of the hydropower projects uh, through uh, through a lot of ethnic resistance, uh, identity politics as well. But these are the designs for viewing some of these parts as what they should be for the future, what should they store for the future. Dams have been very much part of, or have been part of the narrative there, including, and also things like border roads, because it's a border area for, for, for the armed forces, it's a very important strategic area. So it's in India which continue to be so. so there are agroforestry programs that are of the, of the Ministry of Agriculture, there are agroforestry programs of the Ministry of Forest. Both of them don't speak to each other. So what we will be talking about is re-establishing farm forest connections, uh, systems that allow for diversity in choice through that through that engagement that, uh, that takes place, encourage mobility for optimal use over seasonal species in, in this entire in this entire landscape, uh, emphasize of collaborative use of mechanisms rather than property rights. There's an increasing increasing shift whether in the climate change regime or uh, forest rights regime or water rights towards individual property rights. And I think somewhere that is going to really, uh, you know, portion of pieces of farms and forests into uh, land that means nothing much than, you know, you know, what can be transacted in case land use change takes place. Uh, and then actually, actually speak about not just schemes or, but we actually speak about what should be the ultimate environmental outcome. Is the ultimate environmental outcome better life experience, freedom and control over life rather than a set of itemized rights? Thank you. Thank you, Panchal. Our final presentation is titled The Implications of Land Use Change in the Mekong Region of the Upland Forest and Their Services. Will be given by Mr. Dietrich Schmidt Volk, Ecraft, China Office, and Station. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here at this uh, summit. 
In my presentation, I would like to introduce a very special region of Asia, the Mekong region, where we observe massive land use change happening at a very rapid pace in the uplands. And I would like in my presentation to very briefly outline these changes and what, and also outline what are the implications for forests, forest cover, biodiversity, and uh, livelihoods. Um, I'll give a very brief introduction into the Mekong region, into the changes that we are observing, and into what implies that for livelihoods and biodiversity. Um, the Mekong region is a region of that's first of all defined by the Mekong flowing through it, so we count among the countries of the Mekong regions, those countries who are at least partly part of the Mekong watershed, that is Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Laos, and um, two provinces of China. The Mekong region is a region of very intensive and rapid economic change or economic growth that crosses boundaries along economic corridors in both the economic growth and the transboundary nature of the economic growth and the impact of actors across boundaries are important drivers of the land use changes in the uplands of the Mekong region. Um, let's have a first look at the forest cover because we are looking at these changes through the perspective of how they affect uh, the forest. The Mekong region can be divided into two very simple geographic entities. It's the lowlands along the lower parts of the major rivers, first of all the Mekong, and it's the uplands, which are more or less uh, fringing the peninsula of mainland Southeast Asia. And when we look at a uh, remote sensing image, that uh, shows the distribution of forest and non-forest areas and it becomes quite apparent that it's actually the uplands that support the forest. So whatever forest is left in the Mekong region is basically, um, is basically upland forest, uh, which yeah, differs of course, it's a highly complex a phenomenon. Also, the countries of the Mekong region differ from each other quite significantly in terms of forest cover, like, for, uh, for instance, Thailand, which is pretty much devoid of forest cover as compared to Laos, which still is quite uh, closely covered uh, by forest, but also in terms of forest dynamics. Forest cover reducing or forest cover increasing. Also quite important in the context of this uh, uh, presentation is that we can make a very basic distinction of forest types between closed forest, which is the dark color here, and which can be equated uh, roughly with mature or even natural primary forest, and open and fragmented forest, which is more likely to be disturbed forest or secondary forest that grows back after disturbances, such as, for instance, shifting cultivation, which is the key word for the next slide. Before the land use changes have started, that I will outline in this lecture, have started happening. The dominant type of land use in this area, or in the uplands of the Mekong region, was shifting cultivation, which I don't necessarily need to uh, explain to you, but just by pointing out this picture, shifting cultivation is usually a landscape that has a bad name, that has been maligned because of the fact that farmers cut down and burn the forest in order to grow their crops. But what is often overlooked in this process is that at least in traditional rotational forms of shifting cultivation, forest actually grows back. And uh, so shifting cultivation does cut forest, but it also maintains a forested landscape in a kind of dynamic equilibrium. And what is 10 years 
So over the whole landscape, we have a diversity of different types of cropping and different stages of secondary vegetation growing up over a period of 10 years or longer, or in, in cases of degraded shifting cultivation, actually shorter. So the diversity or the heterogeneity of traditional shifting cultivation landscapes is quite important to keep in mind here. Well, as I mentioned, that's basically a thing of the past. Shifting cultivation has been the dominant type of land use until the 1950s, maybe the 1960s, and at least in the region of Southeast Asia, that is definitely changing. And uh, this is uh, a map from a paper that we published in 2012, where we tried to capture the global dynamics of shifting cultivation landscapes, and that shows quite clearly that Southeast Asia, in contrast to other areas where shifting cultivation is practiced, is an area where shifting cultivation declines large scale. The uh, red triangle indicates declining landscapes. So staying two years after the village decided to shift from shifting cultivation to permanent cropping, so the landscape still has above the heterogeneity that is characteristic of shifting cultivation landscapes. Cropping areas and then different patches of forest in different stages of regrowing. But over the long run, then uh, cabbage would dominate. This is a photograph from northern Vietnam, Son La province, where maize, which is these days a very important monoculture crop, has basically taken over, almost completely taken over, a former shifting cultivation landscape. And back here, we are in Shishwabana, the southern, the tropical part of, uh, uh, of Yunnan province, where I'm living where we can see one of the most dramatic land use changes from shifting cultivation to something else, and that is the shift towards rubber plantations. And I would like to talk about this expansion of rubber plantations in Shishwabana in a little bit more detail, because as that is what we are, it's a very instructive case, and also we are doing quite a bit of work on this. The expansion of rubber is dramatic, to put it very mildly, this shows the outline of the prefecture of Shishan Banna, south of Yunnan. And this is a map from a publication that we are just submitting these days on the expansion of rubber from 1988 to 2010. The maps give you an impression. It is an expansion from 1988 when rubber plantations took up maybe 4.5% of the land area of Shishan Banna to 2010 where it takes up 22%. So it's a fourfold. It, um, it's also quite instructive to study this at a smaller level, at the, at the village level, which is what we've done in another project, where we looked at the changes in a village area between 2000 and 2012. So, yeah, basically just um, 12 years difference. Here, um, the light blue color is rubber, so that is what the landscape has changed into. And before that were rotational crops, upland rice. So basically, and that tells you how the rub expansion. Uh, mostly small holder driven 
uh, uh, rubber expansion. It's not done by the government, even though this is China, but this is uh, small over generated um, development. And we are quite worried about the fact that these new rubber plantations may not be very productive in the long run. And that uh, assumption is supported by another study that we did where we tried to calculate the net present value of rubber plantations. That's a value that you calculate over a certain period of time in a certain location where you balance investments and benefits. And what we see again in this difference from 1988 to 2010, that is an increase in the percentage of low value product plantations and a decrease in the percentage of high value plantations. We kind of correlate that with this expansion into higher altitudes where the productivity is lower or may actually never really come about. And so the expansion of rubber is also coupled with an increasing risk uh, with respect to livelihoods. Well, that's uh, the, to some extent the livelihood part right now is still quite okay. Farmers still earn a lot of money, even though risks are always there. Prices falling, diseases breaking out, but also with the increasing expansion, uh, the risk of declining livelihoods. Now, what about the forest? This is um, a graph from one of the earlier FAO uh, overviews of forest uh, dynamics worldwide, which shows in green color the areas where forest cover increases, and in red color uh, the areas where forest cover decreases. And interesting, again, the resolution is very good, but you see the main point. Our Mekong region, where you see both tendencies side by side, uh, declining forest cover, mainly in Myanmar, but also in the lower Mekong Basin, increasing forest cover in Vietnam and in large parts of China. And China actually is very famous now as the country with the fastest growing uh, forest cover. And this graph actually shows you also a timeline of the development of forest cover in China, which shows that forest cover has declined up to a time of 1981 and then gradually increased and actually quite steeply increased. Interesting is that these changes in forest cover are coupled with policy changes. And the turnaround from decline of forest cover to increase is linked to the household responsibility system, which gave farmers more security over land. And here, this again, another policy point 1998, the disastrous Yangtze flood, which uh, led to the sloping land conversion project, which provided incentives to farmers convert farmland to forest land and actually quite a lot of the rubber land has been created within the context of this policy. So that for tree species diversity, these secondary forests compare not badly with uh, more or less natural forests. It's not to say that they can replace natural forests, but it's just to indicate that in terms of biodiversity, these secondary forests can be quite valuable. But we also notice that um, the um, secondary forests are vanishing or declining all over the Mekong region due to accessibility and also due to uh, economic developments such as expansion of rubber plantations, which does not only happen in China, of course, it happens also in other parts of the Mekong region, very dramatically also in Laos, where a lot of secondary forests are say sacrificed for the expansion of rubber plantations and that is just summarized in a short study we did quite a while ago where we looked at the development over five years 1993 to 1997 and where we found uh, even within this short five-year period uh, decline in secondary forests by about 2.6 percent which for such a short period is quite uh, alarming so to sum up, um, upland portions or the Lake of region experience land use change at quite a massive scale and a rapid rate. A significant proportion of land use change is from traditional land uses to 
commercial land uses, and a lot of them three crop base. And well, we can say while well, this, especially when we're looking at the example of rubber, is definitely an example for growth. There is economic growth uh, associated with the expansion of rubber, and farmers are definitely improving their livelihoods, getting a better income. And even though some of this growth can be deceptively green, because forest cover actually is increasing, if you don't look too closely what kind of forest is coming up, and in China, for instance, rubber plantations are counted as forests, so this is also a terminology. So despite these positive aspects, I've also tried to outline that there are risks and dangers in the long run for livelihoods as well as for biodiversity. Thank you very much. I'll pose a few uh, reflections on these three presentations to draw out some common themes, but then also to raise some questions to our panelists. And assuming that there will be time available, we'd also like to open the the floor to questions from the audience, uh, time permitting. So, Karen, if you would like to either use the microphone there or come up here to the podium, it's up to you. And also to kind of link them to some of the broader themes of the conference and raise questions about the broader themes of the conference. Uh, but let me, including on China, India, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Nepal, uh, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Um, and we're going to be participating in, uh, in uh, uh, at the World Mountain Forum in, at the end of, uh, end of this month. Um, and part of this work is funded through the different no for project. So this is kind of my uh, pitch. But backing up, so on this panel on food and biodiversity, at some level, what we're trying to do is, is there's an assumption here, or at least I think there's an assumption here that, that became evident as the panelists were talking, which is that that food production um, and agricultural production is that there's an inverse relationship between food production and biodiversity conservation, right? Not an inverse relationship, at least a relationship that's sort of you know not not necessarily linked together. And what both Chichen and Kanchi's presentations do is they um, is they question this idea that food production and biodiversity conservation are at odds, right? They do so from from different perspectives. But, they, but, but they, what they do is um, contextualize this idea that food production and biodiversity conservation may be at odds with each other. Um, Dietrich's pre uh, presentation also draws attention to the issue of context and how this issue of food production and uh, food security and biodiversity conservation, how that's working out. And at some level, it, it shows that precisely the kind of issues um, that precisely the kind of approaches that we're arguably taking right now to bring these two things into sync with each other might be contributing to the disjunct. Um, let me say that a little bit more clearly. Um, if green growth is one mechanism by which to make food production and biodiversity conservation compatible, then the kind of things that you see in the Mekong Delta, which is the commercialization or the, the production of commercial crops through monocultures, it's putting both biodiversity conservation and uh, food production at risk. So, um, so the thing that occurs to me as I listen to these production, uh, listen to these presentations, and specifically these presentations that they apply to issues of sloping lands, is if you're thinking about the relationship between food production and biodiversity conservation, the kind of dynamics, land use change dynamics that you see on sloping lands, there's a lot that they have to teach you as we think about these issues and try to change the relationship between food and forests. Um, we had asked the panelists to address a few questions. Many of them they already have done so, and I want to raise a couple that they haven't particularly addressed, but I'm posing these questions not necessarily that they answer them completely, but that it generates a discussion as well as perhaps provides an opportunity for you in the audience to think about these issues. So a couple of questions that we have asked to address is what are the challenges or positive outcomes associated with food and biodiversity um, in the current programs targeting sloping lands? And again, all three presentations address this to some to, to different, uh, different extents. And also we asked them to think about what are the kind of research uh, priorities or research 
questions that they would uh, take up as they're addressing the issues of food and biodiversity uh, conservation on developing lands. And again, those are issues that I think all the panelists in different debates have addressed. Two other questions that haven't been addressed per se, again, not that they should have, are what do we as researchers, how do we think that we can influence policy vis-a-vis -vis sloping lands? And do we think that stronger scientific evidence contributes to better policy development and if so how? Uh, the other question, again, not one that they specifically addressed, but which, which have become, uh, which is an important part of, the, of, of this conference, is are multi-stakeholder stakeholder dialogues, I can't say this language because, because stakeholders are a hard term for me, but are multi-stakeholder dialogues effective? When and how are they effective? When and how are they not effective? Do these top-down dialogues work? These are some of the questions that I would want to pose to our panelists as they, as they think about these issues of sloping lands. And I want to take this opportunity, um, uh, one other issue is sort of what are these multi-stakeholder approaches that are happening in landscapes in China and India? How do they differ? How are they going on in other parts of the region? And I want to end by perhaps asking our panelists as well as the audience to think about some of the fundamental Think about the definitions of some of the terms that we're already using. Um, for instance, what do we mean by food security? What do we mean by biodiversity conservation? What do we mean by forests? Um, again, if you think about uh, Kanchi's presentation, she's drawing attention to how in earlier colonial, in, in colonial policy, colonial policy sort of separated um, farms versus food. Now we're trying to bring it back together. So what does that have to say about production systems, increasing productivity? Um, so I want to use this opportunity to ask both our panelists and you all to, kind of, uh, to think about definitions of things like what do we mean by sustainable landscapes, what do we mean by green economy and green growth, and how do thinking about those definitions help us think about the kind of connections we're trying to make as well as the connections we're trying to break. Diversity and the truth that uh, um, food, I, is food security in CCIP is right now is not a problem as I showed you before. But for biodiversity, because uh, mostly the, uh, the CCIP is more culture and is, is better than the previous years, so it's, it's really caused some difficulties, uh, especially like uh, Dietrich shows in southern part of China. But uh, I think. Uh, Northern part of China, the picture is different because uh, in northern part of China, uh, over uh, it's mostly the cropland, uh, sloping cropland are uh, barren, so the tree there is uh, actually increase uh, biodiversity. And uh, for the research, uh, I think uh, for CCFP, uh, we should do in uh, separately for the northern part of China, uh, the, the biodiversity should uh, goes up. But for the southern part of China, because the natural forestry uh, may be uh, replaced uh, by uh, something like rubber. But as I know, Chinese government in the uh, in recent years already launched a lot of uh, programs such as uh, we encourage farmers to, to, to plant real species like uh, teak and uh, other things and the government provide uh, city, uh, free seeding to farmers for them to plant it so things will become better. The multi-stakeholders uh, in, in China, we, we really have a different political system but uh, for CCFP it, it alone we really have a Across uh, cross section uh, sector government linkage uh, committee, we have uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, and uh, water res uh, uh, resources department com combined together uh, for uh, 
confirm a, a, form a, a committee and uh, also involved in all the uh, province into the committee. So if we need big uh, cross-sectional problems, this uh, commission will, will be function. Thank you. I just try to address two of the questions, the last two questions that you spoke about here. One was about the whole uh, politics of multi-stakeholder dialogue. I think uh, we always get a semblance that there is multiplicity of opinions in a multi-stakeholder multi dialogue. But the, the power politics of, is so differential that even the language that different people speak don't match. That, that is at one level. So because the, the frameworks within which we are talking about green economy are not necessarily understood or, or, ne or necessarily uh, have to be thrusted upon people who are, who are, who have been part of green, uh, if so to say, ecosystems uh, for, for, for generations. So I think when you sit across a table, I, you know, the, there is a, there is a semblance of multiplicity of opinions but actually that's not really taking place. The other issue is uh, of the politics of representation. So there might be one or two people who are representing, uh, in, you know, whether it's indigenous communities, farming communities, uh, forest dwelling communities, but that does not necessarily mean that it becomes a multi stakeholder or, or, or a multiplicity of opinions that are across the table. Uh, and this representation, in many ways, becomes a justification to say it's been a participatory approach. So there are many programs that speak the language of participation of, of, of uh, that, we've, that everybody's opinions have been considered. But one one should understand the power, power dynamics through which these these uh, induced cons consents or opinions are actually brought together. The other issue is what kind of policy interventions. I think uh, emphasis invariably is on conservation mechanisms and speaking to people who we think we can influence. Uh, and we you speak to communities where you say, okay, uh, here's an incentive for you to go ahead and conserve or increase productivity of the landscape. How much of policy intervention, even from all of, from our side, is actually towards reducing the actual factors that, is, that are causing those fractures or, or, or causing the degradation of landscapes. I think that the balance needs to tilt much more also on uh, issues on policy interventions that that you know because governments whether it's globally or nationally are constantly uh, contradicting their, their priorities uh, on the one hand there is industrial expansion taking place and on the other hand there is a green india mission and, and forestry expansion taking place and they're constantly at loggerheads with each other in india that's a very critical issue that we need to deal with thank you very much yeah i think i can take the two questions that Kiran asked about uh, how to instigate a policy dialogue and what is the value of multi-stakeholder uh, multi fora together. I would say since I'm working in a regional context, I'd say it would be very different depending on the country I'm working in. You know, it's a, it's a very much a cultural but also an issue that is related to political systems. If I would really try to get things going, for instance in China, I think it would be rather important also to address top level uh, uh, institutions, or maybe even first, but at least also really give them a, a priority. If I work in a place like Thailand, uh, which has a very strong civil society, uh, but also um, st uh, quite strong, let's say, uh, yeah, still, to some extent, also authoritarian structures. Yeah. It would be kind of a true product approach. At the moment, I'm starting to work in Myanmar and learning, also to my surprise, how important NGOs are. So definitely, that would also be a way. So I think you first have to understand the context uh, where you want to operate and then devise your strategy. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the same thing with multi-stakeholder approaches. Again, I would say that uh, I would yeah, first try to understand the context in which I'm working. At one point, but also here, she asked us to think about terms like, for instance, what sustainable landscapes. And since uh, I've tried to show a process uh, by which formerly diverse landscapes uh, turn into very homogeneous and very simplified landscapes, that's where I see the problem. And I definitely 
see less sustainability uh, in these highly specialized landscapes as the rubber landscapes. Uh, still amounted by the worst case scenario of a disease or a pest uh, wiping out uh, rubber plantations as has happened in the Amazon before during an earlier rubber boom. There's nothing that the farmers could really fall back on. We've had extreme cases of villages where, that we studied where they've given up livestock and everything else. And basically, if something like that happened, they would have to migrate out or something like this. And so we feel that maybe uh, trying to reinstitute some level of diversity into these landscapes uh, with more cropping types, maybe more, a, a greater amount of land dedicated to other land uses to give farmers more options would add to the sustainability on the landscape scale. All right, we have about 10 minutes. If there are some questions from the floor, I think we could, we could accept them. We would need to use the microphones for the translation, so if there are questions, if you could raise your hand and we can get a microphone to you. These could be either... In California, the United States, there's been a lot of discussion so far this morning about green growth and the green economy, and especially about the whole private sector in facilitating that kind of green growth, and I haven't heard so much from this panel about that. So I'm wondering if you could tell me, in the context of sloping lands in Southeast Asia, what does green growth or green economy really mean? Like Don't subscribe to the idea of green growth very much, so my response is, uh, might not entirely address your question, but I think one of the goals the private sector needs to really take is reduce the pressures on soil lands. I think rather than speaking about participating in forestry programs or increasing productivity, one of the fundamental things is to reduce those factors. I think those are being, uh, there have been, when it's commercial plantations, through dam building, through mining, through other these kinds of activities. Just once those pressures are increased, our pressure to actually go and uh, rebuild landscapes probably will reduce. Yeah, uh, regarding the green growth uh, in China right now is in uh, its uh, micro level policies for the land conversion program. I think uh, uh, because uh, uh, the afforestation already um, creates uh, much of uh, um, carbon sequence because of the afforestation in this way can contribute to green growth. Thank you. Yeah, they are, they are often, let's say, let's say in the case of China, but also in neighboring countries, they are initiated by policy change. But then in the end, they are largely driven also by private sector. I mean, for instance, I've, I've focused my presentation on rubber, mainly on China, but of course we see now rapid growth of rubber plantations also in Laos, where private investors from China or from Thailand or from Vietnam play a great role. But that is mainly growth oriented. I would say there's not very much green involved in this type of growth. And that's what we see the major challenge actually to really to, uh, introduce the idea of uh, making these types of developments more sustainable. Thank you. My name is Mohamed Indrawat from Climate and Development Knowledge Network. I'm very interested with the experience in Mekong. It, it does seem to promise of uh, green growth because if agroforestry is properly treated then we can have a uh, diversification of products and traditional knowledge uh, can be used to enrich for instance in Sumatra there is uh, in one entire district there is only one older person who know how to tap the resin for Spirak Sumatrana but that can if uh, in another district that is a multi-billion uh, rupiah uh, revenue for the government. So, uh, what do you think? If uh, uh, do you think we need to innovate more? Uh, like, for instance, how we make uh, we make incentive 
out of uh, the need for energy, micro hydro, and then that is to make good uh, forestation program with biodiversity. So that's my question. Do you think we have uh, done enough in Southeast Asia to innovate and make incentive, make benefit of the various uh, products from the forest? Thank you. I think you're definitely. I would say no. There is there's a lot more scope for innovation. I mean, it's uh, Indonesia has a lot to teach, or we can learn a lot from traditional agroforestry systems in Indonesia. If agroforestry is considered an option for green growth, which of course, as a representative of Ikraf, I quite strongly believe in, and we have also a number of projects going on where we try to um, promote or uh, discover, I might say, land use systems which provide tree cover in order to provide landscape protection or diversity or habitat value or whatever, but also which add to the livelihoods of people. We had in China, for instance, we, had, we have a lot of these projects or the, the policies that aim primarily at increasing forest cover without really thinking much of what could be the livelihoods of people. And we've also made quite some progress with projects where we tried to find out products that can play this role from medicinal plants where you can again draw a lot on traditional knowledge or mushrooms for instance which is a great uh, product in, um, in China. So I think there is a lot more scope in designing more diverse and more uh, protective land use systems and being innovative in